the sake of Medina, we are calling upon you, Allah. We are calling upon you, Allah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen. Amma ba'd, fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim الصلاة والسلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا نبي الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا نور الله نبيت سنة الاعتكاف Honorable Brothers in Islam Views of Madini Channel There are many excellences Fadail of reciting Salat al Nabi. In one narration, which is found in Al Hawi Lil Fatawa, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala an narrates, Wa qala aliyun, Khalaqallahu ta'ala fil jannati shajaratan, Thamaruha akbaru min at tuffah. Allah ta'ala has created a tree in paradise, in Jannah, whose fruit is bigger than an apple. وَأَصْغَرُ مِنَ الرُّمَّانِ And smaller than a pomegranate. أَلْيَنُ مِنَ الزُّبْدِ It's softer than butter. وَأَحْلَى مِنَ الْعَسَلِ And it's sweeter than honey. وَأَطْيَبُ مِنَ الْمِسْكِ And it's more fragrant than musk. The hadith continues. وَأَغْسَانُهَا مِنَ الْلُؤْلُؤِ الْرَطِبِ وَأَغْسَانُهَا مِنَ الْلُؤْلُؤِ الْرَطِبِ The branches of the tree are made of pearls. وَجُذُوعُهَا مِنَ الذَّهَبِ And its trunk is made of gold. وَوَرَقُهَا مِنَ الزَّبَرْجَدِ And the leaves of that tree are made of gemstone. لَا يَأْكُلُ مِنْهَا إِلَّا مَنْ أَكْثَرَ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ صلى الله عليه وسلم Listen to this final bit. Sayyidina Ali describes this tree in paradise. And then he says at the end, only that person will eat from this tree who recites Salat ala nabi durood sharif in abundance upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Think about this. If we are successful in reciting Salat and Salam upon the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam abundantly, regularly, frequently, that inshaAllah tabaraka wa ta'ala, we will eat from that tree as well. Inshallah. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, before the bayan, let's make some good intentions that, Ya Allah, I'm listening to this bayan to earn your pleasure, inshallah. Ya Allah, whatever I learn, help me in remembering it and in acting upon it as well, inshallah. Ya Allah, I make the intention to convey whatever I remember to other people as well so that they can benefit too. For our family members, our friends, relatives as well, inshallah. Because the more you spread Islamic knowledge, the more you will remember it. Money is the opposite. The more you spend, the more it decreases. But knowledge, the more you spend, the more you teach others, the more you spread this knowledge, the stronger this knowledge gets in your mind. The more people benefit from it as well, inshallah. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq to make good intentions in abundance. Amin. Honorable brothers in attendance, viewers of Madini channel, our religion of Islam, this beautiful religion, this peaceful religion, this is a religion, a deen, which teaches us and instructs us about looking out for one another, helping one another, pleasing one another, coming to the aid of one another. This deen of ours, it tells us that traits such as selfishness or just thinking about oneself and 
Allah being pleased when seeing others suffer, these are not praiseworthy qualities. In fact, a heart which has these traits doesn't want to help others, doesn't want to please others, doesn't want to come to the aid of others, wants to see others suffer. This is a diseased heart. But our deen of Islam, this tells us that we can be useful to others, we can benefit others, and that is the goal. The more we help others, the more Allah Ta'ala will be pleased with us. One beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Khairun Nas Man Yanfa'un Nas. The best of people, if me and you want to know who are the best of people, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the best of people are those who benefit others. They benefit the people, they don't cause them harm, they don't cause them nuqsan or khasara, loss. Instead, they benefit them, they help them. In this regard, let's listen to some accounts, some parables, inshallah, so that we gain this jazba as well. We gain this passion, we gain this mindset that we should try and help others, inshallah. And the reward for helping others, subhanallah, you will hear very shortly. First of all, Let's listen to an account. This account is written in Hikayate or Nasihate. This is a translation of a classical book written many centuries ago, a Rawdul Fa'iq. In this book, there is an account. There was a poor person, a poor Muslim, who kept a fast along with his family members. Yet he did not have any money to buy food for iftar. Can you imagine? Look at today, especially in Ramadan Kareem, when we fast, at the time of iftar, the table, the dining man, filled with numerous different delicacies, different types of food. The son desires something else, the mother makes it. The daughter wants something else, the mother makes it. So you have a variety of food on the tablecloth. But look at this family, many centuries ago. They desired to keep a fast for the sake of Allah, and this is a nafli fast, not a fard one. Voluntary fast. Yet they did not have any money to buy food for iftar. So when someone is in this situation, then certain shari'i rulings apply to him, for him to ask others for money, etc., becomes permissible. A person is not in need, and if he has a habit of asking others, this is not allowed. But sometimes a person's circumstances and condition mean that he is allowed to ask others for financial help and other things as well. So this person, he, he went out and he entered a goldsmith's market there he saw a Muslim, a goldsmith, who laid out some expensive leather. On top of that leather, he placed gold and silver. Wealthy person. And he said to him, look, this is the situation. Me and my family were fasting. We don't have anything to open our fast with. Just give us one dirham. One dirham, loan me one dirham. I'll pay you back. But with that one dirham, I will be able to go and buy food for me and my family so that we can open our fast. You know what this goldsmith did? His fellow Muslim has come to him asking for help. Remember, if someone comes to you to ask for help, consider that a blessing of Allah. Allah Ta'ala has made you a means of removing that person's difficulty. But this goldsmith, what did he do? He turned away. He turned away, he didn't want anything to do with that person. He ignored him. When he did this, that person, that Muslim, that poor person, who was struggling to find iftar for him and his family, his heart broke. He was disheartened. And he went from there. He continued. And he even said to the goldsmith, I'll do dua for you as well. Give me one dinner. He ignored him. So he continued, his heart is broken, you can imagine, 
He's disheartened. He carries on and he finds another person. This person was not a Muslim at the time, he was a non Muslim. And he says to him that I ask you for one dirham. This is the sketch. I need it to feed my family, feed myself. I'll give it you back. One dirham. And he says, I went to so and so person. He mentioned the early account. I went to so and so goldsmith. I asked him. He rejected me. He refused. He turned the other way. When that non Muslim heard this, and he heard that poor Muslim say, I'll make dua for you as well. The non Muslim said, Here you go, 10 dirhams. You asked for one, 10 dirhams. Go and buy food for yourself and your family. Spend it on your family. And this poor person, he left. And you can imagine he was so happy. And this happens in life. When you go to one person and they reject you, they refuse, they ignore you. And then you go to another person, you ask the same thing and he welcomes you with open arms. He helps you, he aids you and assists you. The happiness that enters your heart. And subhanallah, this Muslim, knew that now he could buy food for himself and his family so that they could open their fast at the time of iftar. So he goes on his way. Night falls, that very same night. The Muslim goldsmith who refused to help his fellow Muslim and didn't even give him one dirham, turned away from him, had a dream. He had a dream. What did he see in that dream? He sees that the day of judgment has been established. Qiyamah has been established. And at that time, there was a severe level of thirst. People were very thirsty. A lot of calamities. Then he suddenly saw a palace. A palace made of pearls whose doors were made of ruby. He raised his head and he said, Oh, owner of this palace, give me some water. I want to quench my thirst. I'm severely thirsty right now, extremely thirsty. Look at this palace. You're the owner. Give me a sip of water. Give me some water. Allahu Akbar. He then heard a voice saying, Until yesterday evening, this palace belonged to you. This palace was yours. But when you broke the heart of that Muslim who came to you, that poor Muslim who was fasting, he wanted to provide iftar for himself and his family, and you rejected, you turned away, you ignored him. When you did that, you broke his heart. This palace no longer remained yours. It was taken out of your possession. It's not one of your gifts, one of your bounties. And instead, your name has been erased and the palace now belongs to a new owner. Who is that new owner? That very non-Muslim who ended up giving 10 dirhams to the same poor Muslim who came to you. The palace is his now. He's earned it. Now what happened? The goldsmith wakes up. He wakes up after seeing this vision, this dream. He goes to that non-Muslim person. And he says to him, and this non-Muslim was his neighbor as well, he says to him, you are my neighbor, you have a right upon me, I need something very important from you. The non-Muslim neighbor says to the goldsmith, what is it, how can I help you? He says, that give me the reward of the 10 dirhams that you gave to that poor person. Meaning he's seen that the reward of that 10 dirhams was what? That the palace which was written for him has been taken out of his possession and instead given to the non-Muslim neighbor. And now he's come to him asking and begging him for the reward. He says, give me the reward of that 10 dirhams that you gave. I'll give you 100 dirhams in return. I'll give you 100 dirhams. You just give me the thawab of that 10 dirhams that you attained by giving it to that poor Muslim. Listen to the, what, what the non-Muslim said. The non-Muslim replied that by Allah, and you're probably wondering how come he said by Allah, he was a non-Muslim. But listen carefully, he said by Allah, 
I will not give you the reward in return for 100,000 dinars. Let alone dirham. Dirham is a silver coin. If you were to offer me 100,000 dinar gold coins, I still would not give you the thawab of that 10 dirhams that I gave to that Muslim who came to me and asked. And then he continues. He said, even if you desire to enter the door of the palace which you saw in your dream last night, I will not give you permission for that as well. And now this, this goldsmith, this Muslim goldsmith is shocked. He says, how do you know about the palace? How do you know? The non-Muslim replied, I was informed of this palace by none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala revealed to me, the one who says kun and it is. Allah Ta'ala revealed to me this and I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah and I also bear witness that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his chosen slave and messenger. So this was the account. It was a bit lengthy but so many lessons can be derived. Subhanallah. This non-Muslim attain the ultimate gift, the ultimate bounty from the court of Allah Azza wa Jal in the form of Iman, faith. And he even realized the importance of faith, the value of faith. Sometimes we disregard it or we, we devalue it rather. We don't understand the importance of faith. We live our, li our lives in negligence at times. But this person, he realized the value of faith. And he said, even if you give me a hundred thousand dinar, I will not transfer you the thawab of the ten dirhams that I lent to that poor Muslim. You didn't help him. The goldsmith didn't help him. But the non-Muslim helped. And Allah Ta'ala in return gave him Iman and gave him a palace in Jannah as well. So here we learn that if we can't help anyone, if we're not in a position to help anyone, that's a different matter. But if we're in a position to help someone, that person has come to our door. Allah Ta'ala has made us the means to remove his distress, his worry. Then why should we hesitate? This could be a means for our forgiveness, for our salvation. Just like this non-Muslim helped that poor Muslim and gained Iman. Today if we help those who come to us and ask us for help, who knows what bounties we will attain from the court of Allah Azza And instead of helping, if we were to dishearten that person, ignore that person, that person has come with so much hope, meaning he, he has tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he knows that Allah has created this world as alamul asbab. This is a world of means. Every day we, we're relying on each other to fulfill our actions. In reality, Allah is the one who wills everything. But Allah Ta'ala has made humans a means for one another. So if someone goes to another with reliance upon Allah and His mercy, but he feels that this person, with the permission, the idhan of Allah, can help his situation, why would we want to dishearten that person? Why would we want to refuse that person, reject that person? So this is something that we must ponder about, pleasing the heart of others and staying far away from displeasing and hurting the feelings of others. In this regard, let's listen to some narrations. Because remember, in our homes, it's necessary for us to please our spouse, our children. When we're with our parents, it's necessary for us to please their hearts. As far as possible, Muslims who come into our interaction, who accompany us, we must please their hearts as well. This is why it's important to know the fadail, the excellence of pleasing the hearts of others. Because this acts as a motivation. Number one, and this hadith is in al mujamul kabir The Prophet ﷺ said, In the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal, the best action after performing the fara'id, the obligatory acts is to make happiness enter the heart of a Muslim. That entering happiness in the heart of a believer, how lofty is this amal? 
the hadith tells us the Prophet sallallahu said after fulfilling the faraid, after your namaz, your fard salah, after giving zakat, hajj, saum, what is the best action in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Pleasing the heart of a believer, a Muslim. How many of us try and find opportunities like this to please the heart of our fellow believer? Something to ponder about. The second hadith, al mu'jamul awsat The beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no doubt, pleasing your fellow Muslim, your Muslim brother, is from those acts that makes forgiveness compulsory. You know, you will be forgiven if you please others. Allah Ta'ala will take this upon His mercy to forgive that person who, who does what? Who pleases others, pleases his fellow Muslims. Another hadith, and this is in Hilyatul Awliya. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever pleases a believer, a mu'min, whoever makes a mu'min happy, Allah Ta'ala will also become pleased with that person. He's in fact made Allah Ta'ala pleased with him. You please a believer, that means you pleased Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And lastly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever makes a Muslim happy, that happiness that is created in the heart of a believer, Allah makes an angel from it. Allah creates an angel, farishta, malak, from that happiness. And that angel worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and speaks of his tawheed, his oneness. When that person reaches his grave after dying, the angel comes to him and says, do you recognize me? Do you know who I am? And he replies, who are you? The angel says, I am that happiness which you put into the heart of your fellow Muslim. And today I am going to rid you of your troubles by pleasing your heart. I am going to help you remember your proof, meaning the kalima shahada. I am going to ensure you remain steadfast on the truth whilst answering the questions of Munkar Nakir, the angels of the grave. On the day of judgment, I will be with you. I will intercede for you in the court of Allah Azza wa Jal and will show you your abode, your place in paradise. All of these blessings for whom? Who attains all of these blessings? Who gains all of these bounties? The one who pleases his fellow Muslim. You please your fellow Muslim. Allah makes an angel from that happiness. The angel worships Allah, speaks about the tawheed of Allah. When a person dies, that very angel comes in the grave and will ask you, do you know who I am? You will say, who are you? The angel will reply that I am that very happiness you entered into the heart of a believer. Today, I am going to remove your worries, your troubles, your difficulties. I'll keep you steadfast. I will help you when answering the questions of Munkar Nakir. This is the blessing of pleasing our fellow Muslims. So instead of violating the rights of each other, Instead of Ma'adullah being bloodthirsty, instead of dishonoring one another, it's very, very important that as believers, we always look out for our fellow Muslims. We strengthen our fellow Muslims. We empower our fellow Muslims. We remove that difficulty. In one hadith, we're told if you remove the distress of a believer in the dunya, Allah Ta'ala will remove your distress on Yawmul Qiyamah. This is the the teaching of our beautiful religion of Islam. But how far have we come from that, unfortunately? Muslims deceiving one another. Muslims not looking out for the best interests of one another. At every opportunity and moment, trying to take advantage of their fellow believer. This is not from the teachings of Islam. In the past, people would look at Muslims, look at their mu'amalat, their transactions, their dealings and conduct with one another. And people would become so impressed that they would enter the fall of Islam. But today, can we say hand on heart that if someone sees our way of dealing with our fellow Muslims, that people would be impressed with us? We try to cut corners, we try to take advantage of others, just so that we can benefit slightly. So this is not from the teachings of our deen. Subhanallah, just a few more 
<coughs> narrations in this regard before I mention an account of Khalifa al Muslimin, Amir al Mu'minin Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala. Sayyidina Bishr Hafi rahmatullahi alayhi says, Pleasing a Muslim's heart is better than performing 100 nafli hajj. 100 nafli hajj on one side. The reward of hajj, subhanallah. But on the other side, what is greater? Pleasing the heart of a believer. Sayyiduna Khaja Nizamuddin Awliya Rahmatullahi Ali has stated, on the day of judgment, the most valuable action will be what? Looking after another person, meaning being considerate towards another person, and pleasing others, subhanallah. Sayyiduna Makhul the Mishqi, Rahmatullahi Ali has said, whoever dies in this state that he has pleased his fellow Muslim, listen carefully, whoever dies whilst he has pleased his fellow Muslim actually dies as a martyr, a shaheed. So when we have so many narrations like this, when we have so many fadail, why do we remain deprived? And we, we should look towards our aslaf, our pious predecessors, rahimahumullah ta'ala, how they would find opportunities to please others. Even if it meant they would have to go through hardship themselves. It was a difficult task that they had to undertake just to please someone else. But they would do it. Listen to this account, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala, Khalifatul Muslimin. We know at night he would walk around and you could say he would patrol the area but at the same time if he found somebody in need he would try and help them as well. He was very God-fearing. He didn't want anybody during his reign, during his Khilafah to be a hujja, a proof against him on the Day of Judgment. So he would go out of his way just to ensure that people are in comfort and ease. One night, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala is walking through the streets of al Madinatul Munawwara. But all of a sudden he hears a voice. And it was the voice of someone suffering a difficulty, a hardship. There was a person sat outside the tent. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an gave salam and asked him what happened. And he found out that the person sitting outside the tent wanted to meet the Khalifa of the time, Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an. Little does he know that Sayyidina Umar is right in front of him. And he had a need from the Khalifa, so he said, I want to speak to the Khalifa of the time. And then he also mentioned that his spouse was in labor and she was about to deliver a child at any moment. So Amir al-Mu'mineen radiallahu ta'ala, who this person does not know that he has just been speaking to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He comes back home and he says to his honorable wife, Sayyidatuna Umm Kulsum bint Ali radiallahu anha, do you want to earn reward? Allah has given you this opportunity. Do you want to earn reward? And she says, what is it? Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala and says, a woman is close to giving birth and there's no one to support her. The wife of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu and says, if you want me to go, I'll go. So he says, gather the important provisions, the things that are needed. So she gathers them and they both reach the tent. When they reach the tent, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an sent his wife inside. Obviously that woman was close to giving birth, so he sent his wife inside and he sat outside with the person. And he said to him, light the fire. The person lit the fire and Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an put a cooking pot over the fire. When the food inside the pot was cooked, at the same time, subhanallah, the child was born. The child arrived into the world. The wife of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an she says, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, give glad tidings to your companion that Allah has blessed him with a son. Now when this person sitting outside the tent heard that address, meaning O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he was shocked. This is Amir al-Mu'mineen, the person I'm seeking, the person I want to speak to. He's been here the whole time with me. Allahu Akbar. So he, he took some steps backwards. He had a bit of awe in his heart now. And with humbleness, he sat down. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh said to him, sit as you were before, be comfortable, don't worry. 
And then he picked up the pot of food, gave it to his wife and said, feed the woman, meaning the one who has just given birth, feed her until she's full. And then he gave the person who was outside the tent, who had been blessed with the son, he gave him food also. And he said, come to me tomorrow morning, I shall fulfill your need. When that person came to him in the morning, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an fixed an allowance for the child and gave that person some money on top as well. Now think about this for a moment, dear viewers of Madini Channel, fellow Muslims in attendance. This is Khalifatul Muslimin, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. Yet he is going out of his way to help someone in his time, a citizen of Madinatul Munawwara. How many of us would do that? He called his wife all the way from home. She assisted with the labor. He himself cooked food. Today, someone who has a bit of status, who has a bit of rank, he, he wouldn't dare do something like that. He would think that this is dishonor for him, that I am the boss, I am so-and-so, how can I be seen doing this? Or how can I be seen feeding or giving food to my employees or serving them? So today, the total opposite situation. But here you have Khalifa al Muslimin, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, who is looking after the people in his time. Who is Sayyidina Umar? Just to give you a reminder, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an is that person regarding whom Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Umaru fil Jannah, that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an is a dweller of paradise, is a Jannati. None of us have that Bishara right now. We have no certificate or sanad like that. We pray to Allah that we enter Jannah. But Sayyidina Umar had that guarantee in the dunya. Yet this was his humbleness. This is his manner of pleasing his fellow Muslims. Also, the Prophet ﷺ prayed for this very same Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an. O oh Allah, honor Islam through Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. This is that same Umar who would stay awake during the night and walk through the streets of Madinatul Munawwara just to look out for the well-being of orphans, the yatim and the helpless. This is that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an, according to whose opinion, according to whose ara, many verses of Quran al Karim descended. SubhanAllah, this is no ordinary person. This is that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an, who himself said, listen to this very carefully, he said, لو ماتت شات على شط الفرات ضائعة that if a goat died whilst hungry at the bank of river Euphrates لظننت أن الله تعالى سائلي عنها يوم القيامة I believe that Allah will ask me about this on the day of judgment. This was how, subhanallah, how much importance he attached to his own responsibility of being Khalifa. Today, loads of things happen around us. We're careless, we're heedless, we're neglectful. Yeah, that's somebody else's matter. That's not my fault. Even though many a times we could help out in certain situations. But here Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh says, if a goat died whilst hungry on the edge of the river Euphrates, then what? I believe that Allah, I fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask me about that on the day of judgment. So when we have rulers like this, when we have Muslims like this, in our communities, in our societies, why will it not flourish? Why will the society not prosper? Why will we not attain immense barakat from the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's only when we neglect the teachings of Islam, we are ghafil, we are heedless, when we are deprived from the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only then. Otherwise, this Al Quran Al Karim, we have this manual, this code of conduct of life. If we follow it the way our Asla follow it, followed it, then why wouldn't we attain blessings? So, pleasing the hearts of fellow believers, this was discussed today. It's very, very important. And the least thing is if we can't please a fellow believer, we shouldn't hurt their feelings. We shouldn't disrespect them. We shouldn't dishonor them. The Prophet said, and I finish with this hadith. One day he looked at the Kaaba, he glanced at the Kaaba al Musharrafa, and he said, Oh Kaaba, the Kaaba has sanctity, we know. Every one of us yearns to go and visit Haram Sharif to do tawaf of the Holy Kaaba. 
the Prophet Ali Wasallam addressed that very Kaaba and he said, O Kaaba, the sanctity of a believer is greater than your sanctity. Meaning the honor that Allah has given a Muslim, a mu'min, is greater than the honor given to al Kaaba al-Musharraf as well. And throughout his life, the Prophet Ali was mindful of his fellow believers, his ummatis. He looked out for them. The Sahaba did the same. You just heard Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu's waqi as well. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us all tawfiq to act upon these beautiful teachings of Islam whereby we please our fellow Muslims. We ensure that happiness only enters their hearts from our side and we do not displease, disrespect or dishonor them. May Allah jalla wa ala enable us to act upon what has been said and to convey these teachings to others as well. Ameen bijahin nabil ameen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For the sake of Medina, we are calling upon you.